Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Dirk Vandeput, CEO of Mondelez. Dirk, nice to see you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. So obviously, Mondelez is in a very competitive business. Talk to us about how you differentiate the company. Well, we're in the first place in the food business, but within food, we're in the snacking space and more particular in the sweet snacking space, uh, which means biscuits and baked snacks and chocolate for us. We are um, the global leader in biscuits and baked snacks by far. And we are a, a number two, a very close to number one in the chocolate market globally. So that gives us strength in one of the most dynamic segments of the food space. Um, we own a number of global brands which are very known and that are very vibrant, often connect really well with Generation Z or Millennials. I'm talking about Cadbury, Milka, Oreo. Um, we have a footprint that is about 40% in emerging markets, which is quite high. And our performance uh, in the last year in emerging markets has been, been by far higher than any of our, our competitors. So we're very strong in emerging markets. And then in developed markets, our growth has been also quite strong recently. So that also is a strength of the, the company. I would say those are some of the biggest differentiators for us versus other companies. So is it the brands? Because you know there are other cookie companies, there are other chocolate companies, there's other salty snack companies out there. How, how do you think about what makes your brand special though? The, our brands are uh, often uh, very known uh, uh, old brands in the sense that they exist sometimes for 100, 200 years. They've been part of the culture. I'm talking about Cadbury, for instance, almost 200 years old, but still our biggest and fastest growing brand. Uh, very up to date with today's consumer, connecting really well. Um, we call those our global brands. And then we have, over the years, we've been able to acquire many what we call local brands, which are sort of grained into the culture. In every country, there's always in chocolate or in biscuits, the one brand that everybody grows up on that's really part of the culture. And we, if you go across the, the biggest countries around the world, we usually have that cultural brand in those countries. And you're able to buy those brands or those companies at a reasonable price and integrate them into your ecosystem? Yes, yes, that's what we do. That's what we've been doing for years. Um, of course, that goes sometimes with ups and downs, but overall, I would say that strategy has been really successful for us. You also have a gum business, Trident, Chiclets, Dentine, Sour Patch. You mentioned Oreo, of course. So I want to ask you with all these mature brands, like take Oreo, um, there was a revenue jump to $4.2 billion in that brand, in that yes. one brand last year. That's up from $2.9 billion just as recently as, as 2018, your share of the cookie business is up. Yeah. So, so how do you grow a mature brand like Oreos? Well, it's all about connecting to consumers and the, especially to the younger generations. So Oreo is a brand about playfulness and we try to remain very playful in the brand's communication, what we do. So we bring, for instance, one way of, of doing that, we bring out special editions. So we had an Oreo special edition designed by Lady Gaga, or we had a Batman Oreo and, and so on. Um, another one that uh, is, is really uh, working for us in Oreo is linking it to big moments uh, that, that are happening in day-to-day -day life and link the communication of the brand to that. Uh, trying to also have a voice on teams of the moment. Uh, another growth engine for Oreo globally is the expansion beyond the U.S. and China. 60% uh, of the Oreo business is in the U.S. and in China at this stage. But we have about 10 other countries where Oreo now is a $100 million brand, growing 20 30% a year. So you could say, yes, it's a mature brand, but outside the US and China, it's a very young brand. Uh, consumers are really only discovering it. So the potential for us to keep growing that brand outside those two countries is, is big. And we have found ways to keep on growing it in the US and in China, where it also has very strong double digit growth. I want to talk a little bit more, ask you a little bit more about Oreo. And can you talk about packaging, mm -hmm. different sizes, 
and then also where it's available, different outlets, different places where you can buy Oreos, and then finally marketing campaigns. You mentioned that a little bit, but maybe you can go, go bit, yes. on a little bit more there. Well, um, the packaging strategy is key and it's really linked to the channel strategy. So if you go to a grocery store and you buy an Oreo pack for a family of four or a family of six, you want a bigger Oreo pack. So it needs to be available at the right price. But when you're on the go, you're on your own, you don't want a big Oreo pack. You might want four Oreos or eight Oreos. So getting the right packs in the right channels for the right moment at the right price point is, is an absolute critical part of our strategy. And, and getting that right is, is really the, the key of uh, growth through channels and through packs. Dirk, we've talked about SKU mania um, <laughs> before a little bit, but isn't there tremendous pressure on you to sort of increase shelf space by coming up with mint Oreos, which I know you've done, and peanut butter Oreos, or just different flavors and just keep expanding and, and to serve fickle consumers? Well, we're, we're trying to fight a little bit against that by supporting the brand to big campaigns through innovative uh, connections with the consumer so that the, the current shelf space can be increased, but by using the same product, just because the brand is growing so much. Um, of course, innovations play a big role. You want to come up with big innovation. I was giving you the example of the special edition Oreos, which is a big deal, yeah. but they go in and out and then they're gone. Um, but we try to avoid an SKU um, sort of uh, expansion because it's complexity in the plant, it's extra cost, it's extra inventory and so on. And, and usually it's not the best way to grow the brand. I think uh, growing the core and the fundamentals of the brand is really the way to go. We're in an inflationary environment right now, Dirk. No one knows that better than you, maybe. Talk to us about how that's impacting demand by consumers and what kind of pricing power you can bring to bear. Yeah, the, the inflation is significant. Uh, last year, our cost input was up uh, 12, 13%. This year, it's going to be the same. And so the reflection of that into pricing is quite important. Um, if if you look at what has happened with the consumer in the middle of all this, um, it hasn't affected our volumes. Our volume growth before this inflationary period was 2-3% a year. It still is 2-3% a year. So the, before we used to price 1-2% a year, now we're pricing just the last quarter, we priced 16%. 16? Uh, 16%. One six. But our overall growth was 19%, 3% volume and 16% pricing. So that's why you see these, these high growth numbers at the moment. Because despite the price increases, uh, the pricing power of our brands allows us not to lose uh, any volume. And that's the uniqueness of this situation, particularly in food, I would say. Most companies are doing quite well in elasticity, maybe not as well as we do. As I see most food companies now have negative volume growth, but it's still quite remarkable that despite these high increases in price, the consumer keeps on buying more or less the same quantities of what they bought. But you before. talked about doing that 16% price hike. You, you can't, can you continue to do that? No, today? no, 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 obviously. We, we only price, and that's important to note, we only price to offset our costs. We are not pricing to keep our percentage margin. Um, and so if we would have to do that, we would have to price a lot more. But we're fine if we can offset our input costs and then um, grow the volume of the brand. And that is what gives us an extra margin lift for us. So, but that's certainly not going to continue. What we're seeing at the moment is that big uh, increase in input costs we saw last year and this year. At this stage, and we, let's say May, uh, we do not see, last year in May, we already could see that the cost for this year were going to go up. This year in, in, in May, we can see that next year's costs are flat or slightly going down. So that's going to mean that our input costs will be similar as what they are this year. And so no need to increase prices next year. I hope it's going to stay like that. So We've talked about international acquisitions, but you made some pretty significant domestic ones here in the United States. Tate's Bake Shop and also Cliff Bars. Yes. What do you look for in an acquisition? Uh, uniqueness, faster growth than our core business, carving out the spot for us in the right uh, segment of the market where we're not playing, uh, the, the strength of the brand, the potential for future growth. Those are all key, key factors for us. And, uh, and Cliff and Tates have that in spades. 
and they're a real addition to our current portfolio. We talked about the gum business a little bit. I think last year you told me that, well, that may not be the real focus of the company going forward. Is that right? Yes, we have announced that we will be divesting our gum business in developed markets, where it's a very small part of our portfolio. The growth of gum is, is relatively uh, low uh, to negative before the pandemic. Um, and so we do keep our gum business in developing markets because they're it's still a very vibrant market and it drives our penetration of the different channels because gum is at every little store in Latin America or in Asia wants mm -hmm. to have. And so it's very important for us. We keep talking about international markets here. Mm -hmm. well, so which countries are the best for you? The, oh, um, obviously these days you can't uh, really think about an in, in, in growth strategy without having China in there. Although recently that's under discussion, but yeah. for any uh, food company. Are you China. still able to do okay in China? Yes, yes, we're doing okay in China. Even during the lockdown, our business did quite well. Uh, and now that the lockdown is over, uh, we, we see uh, very good growth in China. And as I was saying, Oreo is the biggest biscuit brand over there. Um, and then uh, obviously there's the big countries, there's Mexico, there's Brazil, uh, there's India. India is probably the most exciting from our perspective. We're seeing very strong double-digit growth with the potential of expansion that is still uh, quite big. We're not even in half of the Indian stores at the moment. So, mm -hmm. And we already have a $1.5 billion business in India. So. Recently, you talked about taking uh, the Matterhorn off of the Toblerone bar. What's going on there? That seems like a pretty good logo to me. Yeah, it is. Uh, we thought so too. But the, the Swiss have this, uh, this uh, law, which is the Swissness law, which states that if you use one of the symbols of Switzerland, like the Swiss flag or the Matterhorn, uh, you are obliged to produce 100% of your product in Switzerland. We have forever produced Toblerone in Switzerland, and we're not planning to stop nor reduce the quantity of Toblerone that we produce in Switzerland. But the brand is growing and we have to build new production capacity. And we have decided to do that in Slovakia. So because it's just the right thing to do as a company, it's a, it's a much better production environment. And so we have to take the Matterhorn off our pack. That, that is the consequence. Now it's a mountain, so we're going to replace it by an undetermined mountain. And, and we're pretty sure that most consumers won't even notice. You're going to find a mountain in Slovakia or anywhere <laughs> that looks like the Matterhorn? No, we're not going to make it look like the Matterhorn. It's going to still be a mountain on the packaging, basically. So the Swiss want you to, if, no matter how big the global brand is, they want to make every single Toblerone bar in Switzerland. Like you couldn't set up a plant in the United States. No. Not if, with a Matterhorn if you it. If you want to really claim Swiss origin, that's you can claim... If you don't claim that, you can produce anywhere you want. But if you want to use something that is a symbol of Switzerland, you're not allowed to do it. And so. when's that going to happen? That's going to happen. Uh, we already are working on the change right now. We wanted right. to announce it, but in the next six months, you will see the change. And final question, Dirk. Why should investors buy, hold, or invest in your stock, in Mondelez stock going forward? Well, we, I think we have a, a, a formula now that that is sort of, uh, a virtuous cycle whereby we have found ways to really connect to our consumers. We invest in our brands. Um, that leads to good growth. We generate extra margin. That margin is half reinvested in the brands. The other half goes to the bottom line. And we seem to be able to do that over and over and over again. We did it throughout the pandemic. We do it in this inflationary cycle. So we're a, a great defensive play. I think you should be able to count on a above 10 percent tsr year after year after year so it's a it's a long term buy and hold stock and i, and I think in today's world that's something worth uh holding dirk vanderput ceo of mondelez thank you so much for joining us thank you for having me you've been watching at barons i'm andy serwer we'll see you next time